Good afternoon, Robert Scribbler. It is November 27th, 2018. Thank you for joining me for another climate change and clean energy video blog. Now for this segment, what I'm going to do is provide for you a brief overview of the highlights of the most recent National Climate Assessment Report. And I just want to highlight that this report is a real doozy. The report in brief, the the uh, truncated version of the report is 196 pages long and it includes a broad assessment of not only present impacts to the United States due to human caused climate change, but predicted impacts based on various future scenarios at, which, which are predicated by how much fossil fuels we burn and how much carbon we emit into the Earth's atmosphere. Before I get into the study details and highlights, I'd just like to point out that this report is the first of its kind in a number of respects. One, it is, it is the first report to really intensely sound the alarm bell on the issue of human cl caused climate change to point out that severe impacts are happening now and to point out an, an observed increase in extreme events since the publication of last report in 2014 on a scale that, that now at this time at present, communities, cities and towns across the US are threatened by factors related to human-caused climate change. Towns like Paradise, California, in which practically all of the structures were born, cities burned. Cities like Miami and other coastal communities like the Hampton Roads region and New Orleans that are in facing, in facing increasing impacts from sea level rise. And other communities across the country that are seeing increasing instances of extreme rainfall event and extreme storms and other harmful or damaging impacts related to human caused climate change. Now, also before I get into this report, I'd like to state that the primary driver of human caused climate change is fossil fuel burning and the primary mitigator for human caused climate change is reducing human carbon emissions by reducing fossil fuel burning or or and or working to to mitigate the the carbon emissions from fossil fuel burning sources and it's worth noting that at this time at present we do have new technologies that are becoming increasingly available to replace fossil fuel burning such as wind solar batteries and electric vehicles, among others, they're seeing a massive positive learning curve, meaning that the cost of access and the barriers to access of these new energy sources are falling. So, so we do have a route for rapidly reducing carbon emissions, but at present, the political will to follow that path is, for lack of a better word, conflicted meaning that those who deny the impacts of climate change or downplay the impacts of climate change or confuse the obvious necessity to attempt to mitigate climate change by working to transition to clean energy, hold power in political office and have served to block policies like the Paris Climate Agreement and Obama's clean energy plan at the US level and other policies like higher fuel efficiency standards for vehicles or incentives for things like wind and solar and electric vehicles at both the national and state levels. On the other side, we do have political forces that appear to be waking up and pursuing these mitigation and the follow on adaptation strategies that will be necessary to deal with the climate change impacts that we are already seeing and that are coming down the pipe. So our choices as citizens and as voters and our voices as, as citizens are very important now as we confront the rising risk of, of what is a severe 
and worsening systemic problem. Okay, so a long introduction to a big report. I, I am going to try to hit these highlights in brief, but there are a lot of highlights, and um, please excuse me if it takes a little bit of time. First off, I'd just like to point out that the National Climate Assessment does find that human-caused climate change is already impacting the U.S. in a number of aspects, and, and, and not just in the form of extreme weather, but just, just on, a, on a variety of parameters. And I'm just going to provide for you a, a butcher board of, of these impacts. I'm also going to provide a hat tip to the Scientific American and their sources who, who help to, to, to boil down this summary. I will be providing a link to the Scientific American article as well as the National Climate Assessment Report. I encourage you to read both. So, so for the US, the most obvious impact from human-caused climate change is that temperatures across the US are rising. And since the 1960s, we have seen an increase in the heat wave season period in days from about 21 to about 68 at present. So more than tripling of the heat wave season across the US. Heat related events are worsening and most major cities are, are seeing a, a more than a month increase in the period in which heat waves occur. Spring is coming earlier and autumn is, is ending later. And the sea ice off Alaska has been declining at a rate of about 10% per decade. Overall, US, the frequency of heavy precipitation events has increased substantially since the early 20th century, rising from an average of about 10% um, of the land area experiencing heavy precipitation events in 1910 to around 15 or 16% or of the land area. So 50%, so approximate 50% increase in land area affected by heavy pre precipitation events. And this is driven by, by warming temperatures, which increase the velocity of the hydrological cycle, increasing the rate of evaporation and precipitation by approximately 7% for each degree Celsius of warming in, in the global system. Now, snow packs across the US West have been dramatically declining and large wildfires raging across the, uh, are, are raging across the Western US with increased frequency with hotter and drier conditioners, can, hotter and drier conditions lengthening the fire season. Uh, and, and here is a, a graphic of the change in U.S. snowpack across the West, where we see very dramatic losses in U.S. snowpack over recent years, as well as an overall uh, aggregate loss of, of sea ice in, in the Arctic. Now. Floods are also increasing across the U.S. due to both sea level rise and increasing heavy rainfall events, and increasing extreme rainfall events. So, and, and these impacts are, are broadening impacts to coastal infrastructure, to U.S. cities. East Coast sea level rise is faster than the global average. So the U.S. East Coast is, is under the gun for, for increasing sea level rise due to a num number of factors, not just due to the thermal expansion of the oceans and melting ice packs, but also due to current change and where gravitational effects distribute sea level rise across the world. Uh, many cities are already facing increased flooding, worsening storm surges, as, and as a result are being forced to install flood pumps and other infrastructure to help deal with floods. In the southeast region of the US, high tide flooding has increased by a, by a multiple of 10 or by times 10 or an order of magnitude since the 1960s. So, so major impact already visible 
in in the U.S. and and, and in particular in the southeast. And as you can see in this graph, the change in sea level is is rather dramatic for the U.S. over the course of the 20th and early 21st century. Coral reefs have experienced increased rates of bleaching, and according to the National Climate Assessment, this, these rates of bleaching are expected to increase as the Earth continues to warm, if uh, fossil fuel burning and other carbon emissions continue. And the decline in sea ice is changing the timing of the annual algae blooms, which are major drivers of productivity for the oceans. It's also shifting the algae blooms northward. Warming has expanded the population of parasitic pine beetles, and as a result, 25 million trees have died in just the last eight years. And that's just due to pine beetle incursion. It's also worth noting that due to the California drought, which is now entering its 362nd week, 129 million trees have lost their lives as well. And, and trees provide key ecosystem services and increase the, the health not only of the U.S. environment, but the U.S. population as well. Birds have shifted north and the timing of annual bird migrations has changed. So just a list, uh, a list of impacts and, and, and certainly not a totally comprehensive list of impacts that we are already seeing from human caused climate change. But what's also more stunning about this, well, what's also rather stunning about this report is the clarity with which the report describes the potential impacts that we could see on into the future based on various fossil fuel burning scenarios and or emission scenarios. So, so looking at this graphic here from the National Climate Assessment, the projected annual temperature increase across much of the United States under a high fossil fuel burning, high carbon emissions scenario would be in the range of three to five degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature by the middle 21st century and under a lower emission scenario would be in the range of two to four degrees Fahrenheit increase, both significant increases in U.S. temperature on, on top of the, or increasing from the approximate 1.8 degree Fahrenheit increase that we have already seen. So, so temperature impacts increasing through mid-century, it's worth noting that the end century impacts are look rather stark under the high emission scenario with a large region of the US seeing eight degree Fahrenheit or higher increases. That includes much of the northern tier of the US and a big chunk of the west and central US as well, with the average ranging from six to eight or more degrees Fahrenheit above baseline Holocene averages if fossil fuel burning continues to, to increase and is not abated. And if fossil fuel burning, even if fossil fuel burning is abated, abated we're looking at a two to six degree Fahrenheit temperature increase across the lower 48 United States, according to this national climate assessment. All those temperature impacts would result in, in other impacts as well. I'm going to go into just a few of them. Now, the projected change in sea level rise under the high emission scenario for the U.S. East Coast ranges from three to six feet or more, which, which is a rather high level of sea level rise. It's worth noting that a, a recent NOAA assessment found uh, a, a a potential for an average sea level rise of around five feet for the U.S. East Coast by the end of the century under a, a high emission scenario in which uh, fossil fuel burning uh, ramps up and, and continues to remain high. And under, under the lower emission scenario, U.S. East Coast sea level rise is projected to range between about one to for possibly as high as, as five feet in some locations, but, but significantly less sea level rise under the lower emission scenario 
in which um, fossil fuel burning is abated and, and we cut carbon emissions. Also worth noting that the RCP 4.5 scenario, the, um, the lower scenario, which actually is, is a mid-range um, warming scenario, could be further abated with more aggressive policy. And, but, but that window is, is starting to close. And we, we've got about an eight to 12 year time frame to, to hit lower than, than a mid-range warming scenario and to implement policy that, that's going to, to prevent um, this level of, of sea level rise uh, related to, to human forced global warming. Now, a lot of people talk about military readiness and, and climate change, and, and climate change is seen by the military as a threat multiplier. It is a national security issue in that it increased desperation and unrest and the potential for exploitation by bad actors across the globe. And so there are a number of, of very serious scenarios that the Defense Department is looking at as it relates to human-caused climate change. But in addition to that basic fact, U.S. military installations, just like all infrastructure ac across the U.S., are, are threatened by uh, human-caused climate change. And in the future, these installations and assets with multiple climate-related vulnerabilities have been identified by the orange dots across the continental U.S., Alaska, Guam, uh, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii. And as you can see, the distribution of U.S. military assets with multiple vulnerabilities to human-caused climate change is practically ubiquitous across the U.S. And so as we look forward to potential impacts from human-caused climate change, it's important to see the problem not just as an ecological problem, but also as an economic problem and, and a national security problem. If you, if you warm the world and you warm it as rapidly as we're warming it, you, you increase damage to all kinds of critical things, all kinds of things that we rely on from, from stable growing seasons to, to the structure of our cities, to, to the very national defense forces and materials that we rely on to, to keep America safe. So I thought this was that was an important graphic. Another forward-looking issue for human-caused climate change is coral bleaching. Now, corals are, are a key species in the ocean. They support, in some estimates, upwards of a million different species in the world ocean system. Corals are like the rainforests of the ocean. And unfortunately, human-caused climate change is projected to provide a big hit to corals around the world. And, and the U.S. itself it is, not a, 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 it is not protected in any way to impacts of corals. And, and this graphic shows the expected period of time in which severe impacts would arrive to certain regions of the U.S., particularly for U.S. islands, starting before 2030 in the dark red and running in through 2045 in, in the white. And this is under a... Um, this is, is, is under a, a projected impact under the higher emissions scenario. So, so under a high fossil fuel burning scenario and a higher carbon emissions scenario, you end up with, with severe impacts to corals starting just within about a decade in, in some locations. And this is worth noting that we've already seen an increased increasing instances of severe coral bleaching, but but by the late 2020s and early 2030s, it becomes much more widespread if, if fossil fuel burning and carbon emissions continue to remain so high and continue to increase. And one final graphic that I would like to show you from this National Climate Assessment Report is, is an, an economic, economic uh, impact graph. And what it finds is that we, we have severe impacts to both labor and air quality due to warming that result in major losses in economic productivity. Now, I, I just like to point out that this, this graphic only indicates two 
aspects of the U.S. economy. But losses from labor under the higher fossil fuel burning and higher carbon emissions scenario is estimated to be by itself, just, just, just to labor, $150 billion a year by 2090. And even under the mid-range warming scenario, in the range of about $80 billion a year, and that's just to labor. It's also worth noting that economic losses due to impacts to air quality from things like increasing um, harmful ozone due to heat or increasing wildfire emissions is in the range of about 30 to 30, yeah, around $30 billion a year in the high emission scenario, the high fossil fuel burning and high carbon emission scenario, and around 20 billion a year in the mid range. I just like to point out that, again, the, these are just impacts to just two sectors uh, of the US economy, and the, these are yearly damage estimates. Climate change reduces all of our, our prospects in this way by generating more damage and resulting in an increasing difficulty for, for adaptation. You have to spend more to adapt more in the higher fossil fuel burning scenarios, in the higher carbon emission scenarios. But just something else that the National Climate Assessment pointed out that is not on this graphic, but, but it is rather important to consider is that there are over one trillion, that's trillion with a capital T, one trillion dollars in assets at risk along the U.S. coasts due to sea level rise driven by human-caused climate change. So just a few highlights from the National Climate Assessment. It is a really, really large report, but it is an in-depth and, and a worthy report to read, one that highlights the, the basic need to provide rational policy to reduce the impacts of human-caused climate change and to move the U.S into a, a firmer footing from, from the aspect of, of transitioning to clean energy. And before I, I finish, I would like to just read this statement from the World Resources Institute as a response to the national, this, this essential national climate assessment report. Uh, Lan Lashoff, U.S. Director of the World Resources Institute notes, the message is loud, clear, and undeniable. Climate impacts are here and growing. The tragic campfire in California serves as a stark illustration of how climate change is loading the dice for more extreme events that devastate people, homes, and the economy. We should trust what we're seeing with our own eyes, more intense wildfires, more intense hurricanes, flooding, and heat waves. This is what climate change looks like and it will become far worse unless we rapidly shift to a low carbon economy. Climate change is already taking a toll on US agriculture, US health, tourism, fisheries, energy, transportation, infrastructure, businesses, and more. For example, $1 trillion of public infrastructure and private property along the US coastline are at risk due to rising seas, increasing storm surges, and tidal flooding. No region of the country and no sector of the economy is immune. We must all use the tools and pursue all policy levers to turn the tide. The National Climate Assessment Report makes it clear that we need a rapid and decisive shift to a low carbon economy to achieve inclusive, long-term economic prosperity across the United States. So a very important statement and a statement that should ring loud and clear in juxtaposition to the vastly irresponsible climate change denial and dissembling and, and casting doubt on, on very solid science by a number of politicians, including Trump and, and his, his present administration in the White House, as well as his political supporters. So, just again, the U.S. is facing climate impacts now. The responsible path is to respond, to cut carbon emissions, and to work to harden our infrastructure on all levels to the impacts and the harm that are coming down the pipe. 
Thank you for joining me, and I'll be chatting with you soon.